the Khyber Pass on the northwest frontiers of the Indian subcontinent, linking Pakistan with remote Afghanistan. To drive north through the sullen mountains is to journey backwards in time to an isolated nation which has consistently ignored the approach of a 20th century world. But this year, events have caught up with and overtaken feudal Afghanistan. Traditionally a buffer state, standing alone between major powers, it has suddenly caught world attention. New men have seized control, men who appear willing to reactivate ancient grievances and to assist the ambitions of powerful friends. In this edition, Echo looks at a tiny nation engulfed in big issues, Afghanistan. For centuries, the Pathan tribes of Afghanistan have lived by their own rules. Here, a man carries a gun as a badge of honor, and most use them with deadly accuracy. Here, even today, tribal chiefs rule with absolute authority and tolerate no interference, even from the state. Armed with independence of spirit, they've never compromised with foreigners. The British came here and stayed long enough to fortify such ragged borders as could be established. But they retreated, leaving little more than a few rusting relics. Islam, in one of its more straight-laced forms, is the national religion. The power of religious authority remains a conservative force, regardless of who rules in Kabul, the capital. And the streets of the capital illustrate this nation's problems, principally that of poverty. The average annual income in this country is less than $75. The illiteracy rate is 90%. Slavery was officially abolished only in 1947. And now there has been a revolution. King Zahir Shah was ousted and his cousin, Mohammed Daud, decreed Afghanistan a republic. The king went into exile. The new regime has the backing of Afghanistan's small but powerful army, and that in turn is supplied and equipped by the Soviet Union. The troops are Afghans, but the heavy weapons, tanks, advisors, ammunition and fuel come from the Red Army. It was President Dowd, Prime Minister until 1963, who first encouraged Russian assistance. And Moscow did not hesitate to take advantage of the invitation. They poured in aid, both military and civil. They built this enormous power plant on the Kabul River. They even mollified the Muslim community by building the odd mosque. Curious indeed, for they suppress their own Muslims in the Soviet Union. But the Soviet presence in Afghanistan has little to do with altruism and everything to do with an old Russian ambition to gain access to the Indian Ocean by an overland route. Afghanistan is a stepping stone. Between it and the sea is the Pakistani province of Baluchistan, but the Russians are at work on that problem. 
While wooing the Afghan regime with showy new projects, such as this housing scheme, the Soviet Union is actively backing Afghanistan's long-time claim to Baluchistan, whose people, like those of Afghanistan itself, are Patans. If Kabul's old longing for this valuable strip of territory could be fulfilled, the bricks and mortar of Soviet diplomacy would have built them a road to the sea. One thing that stands in the way is the presence of their bitterest enemy, the Chinese. They fully understand Soviet ambitions in this area and have busied themselves with a number of practical civil aid programs while keeping a close eye on developments, especially those concerning Afghanistan and the Chinese ally, Pakistan. <laughs> While they remain, the Russian dream of rolling down to the Indian Ocean is unlikely to come true, for the Chinese themselves would be interested in opening up the same access to the sea, and more important, to the oil of the Persian Gulf, of which the Chinese domestic economy is in increasing need. Until Mohammed Daud's coup, the Afghans had played a waiting game, accepting aid from all quarters. They thanked the Chinese for building their roads, but opened the aid gates to the west as well as the east. In case number two, what ah. wollen wir jetzt hier beginnen? Commentateurs ont inclus eux la revue de Bisbout. Bon de tout, à la salle. Afghanistan has always been suspicious of foreigners but King Zahir Shah knew his country desperately needed what these foreigners could bring. Now, Mohammed Daud has, for all intents and purposes, allied himself with the Soviet Union. The ordinary Afghan, caught in the endless circle of subsistence living, now has his future in pawn to the Russians as well. And the future does not look that good. While the Russians were building pretentious airports and roads, thousands of Afghans have died. A three-year drought has destroyed bullocks and crops. Water and grain supplies dwindled. There is little enough economic basis on which to build a new people's democracy. The remote rural markets have had little to trade, but the bargaining goes on in the traditional spirited manner. In fact, the whole country may have become yet another sensitive political marketplace, a future cause of international infighting. But to anyone who can expect to earn no more than $75 a year, there are more important things to haggle over. So despite the fact that they are the backwoodsmen of Asia, the Afghans and their nation have attracted interest and concern around the world. If Soviet strategy in this part of the world is consistent, it seems at least possible they were behind the fall of King Zahir. In his place, they have, in President Dowd, a man whose policies they may be able to shape. Already, he has made appropriate noises in the direction of Pakistan and is encouraging separatist movements among Pathan peoples in that country. Whatever moves Afghanistan makes now, every step will be watched closely by those nations who could be affected. The Soviet Union, China, Iran, Pakistan, India. Afghanistan is still the buffer between big nations involved in the Indian subcontinent, as it was a century ago. But the nations are more powerful today, and the issues 
more dangerous.